Section 20 of Japanese Girls and Women This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Japanese Girls and Women by Alice M. Bacon. Within the Home, Part 2. With the coming in of the last month of the year begin the preparations for the great New Year's festival, and the housekeeper finds herself occupied through every moment of the brief days. A woman who is at the head of a large household has upon her hands in the month of December spring house cleaning and preparations for Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving and Easter, all at once. The work of getting the family wardrobe ready for the festival must begin very early in the month, for every man, woman and child in the household must be provided with new clothes, and the thrifty housewife sends no sewing out. In the old days it was ordained that the eighth day of the twelfth month should be a needle festival, a day on which all women rest from their sewing and amuse themselves by indulging their own fancies instead of their husbands, as is their duty on other days. This day was supposed to mark the dividing line between the old years and the new years sewing, but, as a matter of fact, the four-handed woman will finish up the old and begin the new even earlier in the month, so as to have this part of her work well out of the way before the house-cleaning, which should be begun no later than the 15th. This house-cleaning, even with the small amount of furniture found in a Japanese house, is an elaborate affair. Every box and closet and rubbish-hole in the house is turned out and put in order, the tatami are taken up and brushed and beaten, the woodwork from ceiling to floor is carefully washed, the plaster and paper walls flicked with the paper flapper that takes the place in Japan of our feather duster. All the quilts and clothing must be sunned and aired, the kakemonos and curios belonging to the family unpacked, carefully dusted, and put back into their wrappings and boxes, and the house and garden put into perfect repair. This work, if thoroughly done, takes about a week. When all is finished, even to the final purification by beating everything in the house with a fresh bamboo, games and festivities and soba are in order. In the old daimyo houses, where great numbers of men and women were employed, and where the women's quarters were in a distinct part of the house, it was considered a great joke to catch a man on the women's side any time between the close of the cleaning and the beginning of the new year. The intruder was promptly seized and shouldered by the women, who carried him about the house in triumph, finally returning him to his own quarters. If by any chance they could catch the chief steward, they sang as they carried him about. This is the great pillar of the house. May he be happy till the stone foundations rot. The week following the house-cleaning is devoted to the preparation of food for the festival. Of this, the most characteristic is mochi, a sort of dumpling made of rice steamed and pounded, the preparation of which is so difficult and protracted a process that it is not lightly undertaken. It is so distinctively the festival food of Japan that if you find mochi in a friend's house at any time except a new year, you immediately ask what has happened, and are pretty sure to be told that it is a present received in celebration of a birth or a marriage or some other domestic festival. It is, to Japanese children, what turkey and cranberry sauce are to American children, not only a delight to the palate, but a dish the very smell of which brings back the most cheerful occasions in the year. When the mochi is made and set away to await the festal day, the matter of decoration must be attended to. At every gate is erected some token of the season, if it be only a bit of pine stuck into the ground, or a wisp of straw rope decorated with white paper gohe. The great black gates that indicate the homes of the wealthier classes are almost concealed by structures of pine and bamboo, on which oranges, lobsters, straw rope, straw fringe, white paper, and images of the good luck gods are used as decorations. 
all these things are either efficacious in keeping off evil spirits or are symbols of good luck within the house in the tokonoma or place of honor in the best room great cakes of mochi two three five or seven in number are set one upon another in a dish covered with fern leaves and the structure surrounded by seaweed before the new year comes in the capable housewife will have sent out presents to every one who has during the year been of service to her husband her children or herself in any way her own servants will be remembered with gifts of clothing something will be sent to the servants of friends at whose houses any of the family have visited often and every dependent poor relation employee and employee's child must be given a present large or small according to the amount of obligation felt by the giver to persons of greater wealth and importance to whom the family are grateful for past favors or from whom they are hoping for something in the future gifts often quite out of proportion to the resources of the givers are sent a method of investing capital that is a little risky though it sometimes yields prompt and bountiful returns on the other hand all the merchants and marketmen who supply the house send presents to the mistress and frequently to the head servants as well and furushiki bundle handkerchiefs cooking utensils packages of sugar boxes of eggs dried fish etc flow in at the kitchen while crepe silk cotton cloth money toys curios and other valuables flow out of the parlor all this present giving is a severe tax upon the strength and resources of the housekeeper and adds heavily to the burden that the last month of the year imposes upon her by the twenty-fifth or twenty-sixth of the month the tradespeople begin to send in their bills for every man expects to square up all his accounts by the last night of the old year and early payments are expected and made so that all may begin the new year out of debt so universal is this custom that the man who finds at the eleventh hour that he cannot clear all of his debts is likely to offer his property at a heavy sacrifice in order to secure the necessary cash for any one with ready money extraordinary bargains are to be met with in japanese shops during the last week of the year in case this resource fails suicide is still a short and honorable way out of a world that has become too difficult to live in the japanese housewife must feel when december has been successfully passed like the yankee who had noticed that if he lived through the month of march he generally lived through the rest of the year the observances of january for which december has been one long preparation begin with the rising of the new year's sun and continue in one form or another for about two weeks almost every day has its special food and its special festival duty for the first three days the very best clothes in the wardrobe are worn by everybody then till the seventh the second best and from the seventh to the end of the month new clothes though not the very best must be worn within the first seven days every man in japan is expected to call on all his friends and acquaintances but the women probably out of consideration for the many duties that the festival season puts upon them are given until march to finish up their new year's calls the streets of the cities and even of the small villages are full of life and interest for a week or two kurumayas in their new winter liveries trundle around fathers and mothers and happy children all manner of mummers musicians and dancers go from house to house in search of custom the manzai who with dances and songs and strange grimaces undertake to drive out from your house for the new year all the devils who may have been residing there hitherto are a special feature of this season in every garden and in the public streets little girls their faces freshly covered with white paint their shining black hair newly dressed their wing-sleeved kimonos gorgeous with many colors play battledore and shuttlecock toss small bags half filled with rice or pat balls wound with shining silk to the accompaniment of a weird little chant 
For the boys there are kites of many shapes and colors, or tops that they spin under everyone's feet, well knowing that no one in Japan is too busy to turn aside for a child's pleasure. The very horses, small, shock-headed, evil-tempered beasts, who drag tremendous loads with many snorts and snaps at their masters, are decked out with gay streamers that reach nearly to the ground, at the ends of which are tinkling bells. The festival season closes on the 15th and 16th with a visit to the temple of Yemma, the god of hell, and with a holiday for all the apprentices. Next to the New Year's holiday, perhaps the most important festival of the Japanese year is Obon, the Feast of the Dead. This is, in its present form, a Buddhist institution, but in spirit it fitted so exactly into the ancient Japanese ideas of the tastes and habits of departed spirits that it merely supplanted the old Shinto feasts of the dead, and it is a little difficult today to determine whether its observance is more Buddhist or Shinto in its character. To find the Obon ceremonies in their most perfect form, it is necessary now to go into the more remote country villages, for though, even in Tokyo, this feast is still one of the most important in the whole year, it seems to be more distinctly itself in a small village, where all the old forms are still kept up. In Tokyo, the three days festival is kept by the new calendar, and occurs on the 14th, 15th and 16th of July. At Obon, as at New Year's time, it is customary to square off all obligations by a general giving of presents. This, while not quite as important a matter as at the beginning of the year, is still a severe tax upon the time, purse and memory of the wife and mother in any large family. At this time, too, as at New Year's, mochi or some other festival dish must be provided, but at this point the resemblance between the two occasions ceases. In accordance with its character as a feast of departed spirits, the observance of Obon is distinctively religious. On the 12th, the family go to the graveyard and clean and put in order the graves and tombstones, so that the returning spirits may find all properly cared for. Fresh water and flowers are placed before each stone, and sometimes rice and fresh vegetables. At home, the ancestral tablets in the Butsudan form the center of the ceremonies. Before the shrine are placed, on the 13th, offerings of food of any kind that can be made without fish or meat. Great balls of mochi, sake, flowers, and choice new varieties of vegetables are appropriate offerings. All are tastefully arranged, the lamps are carefully lighted every night, and special services are held before the shrine. For the three days of the feast, the souls of the dead are believed to be visiting their old haunts, and to need light and food and all the conveniences that their descendants can spare them. Each house is decorated with lanterns, that the spirits may be able to find their way. It is from this custom that the feast is often called by foreigners the Feast of the Lanterns. As I have already said, in Tokyo and other modernized places, this feast is not seen at its best. Only the soft glow of the lanterns swinging from every house, and the decorations in the graveyards and at the household shrines, indicate to the traveller that anything unusual is going on. But in the country regions it is quite another matter, and the welcoming, entertainment, and proper dismissal of the visiting spirits form the entire business of the community for three days. Usually the middle of August is the time for the country celebration. On the 12th, bands of children carrying red lanterns march singing through the village on their way to the graveyard, where the annual cleaning is taking place. That night, bonfires in the cemetery and before the houses light the pathway of the wanderers. Then, for three nights, all the young people of the village gather in the temple court in grotesque disguises and with towels over their faces, and dance all night long in the moonlight to primitive music produced by a drum and the monotonous chant of the dancers themselves. These three dance nights are the great occasion of the year to the young peasants, 
for this is the only time when persons of both sexes meet together in a social way and it is looked forward to and enjoyed intensely of late years the government fearing the abuses that grow out of this exceptional social event has endeavoured to suppress the dancing but it continues in full vigour throughout most of rural japan though conducted with more decorum than formerly on account of the standing dread of police interference the object of the dance is to amuse the spirits of the ancestors who must be imagined as hovering in the background viewing with approval the antics of their descendants other amusements are going on in the village on the Obon evenings at a summer resort every hotel keeper will have a professional storyteller a company of musicians or some other entertainment to which the guests of the hotel are invited and at which as many of the villagers as can crowd to the open house fronts stare until the dance drum in the temple court draws their feet in that direction and then on the last night of the feast bonfires are once more kindled at every house so that the spirits may find their way safely back to the land whence they came and not stay to haunt their descendants at improper seasons no account of life in a japanese home would be complete without a little space devoted to the special delights of the small boy although this book deals mainly with feminine concerns the small boy in japan as in america is the life and fun of the home and one cannot fail to notice his times of surpassing enjoyment he rules the house and his mother and his grandmother and his sisters at all times and his activity and enterprise secure for him a good share in any fun that is going on but there are certain seasons that appeal to the boyish heart with a special message and of which he is the central figure as the feast of dolls is to the girls so is the feast of flags to the boys their own special day set apart for them out of the whole year it comes on the fifth day of the fifth month now may fifth and for long before its arrival the shops are gay with all manner of tempting toys while in every yard rises a great bamboo pole from which when the time comes will float an enormous carp its body inflated by the strong spring winds its great mouth wide open and its eyes glaring hideously as it fights its way against the air currents sometimes there will be half a dozen such poles in one yard signs either that the household is blessed with many boys or that the way to its heart is through gifts of toys to its son and heir when the great day at last arrives the feast within the home is conducted in much the same way as the feast of dolls there are the same red covered shelves the same offerings of food and drink but instead of the placid images of the emperor and empress and the five court musicians the household furnishings and toilet articles there are effigies of the heroes of history and folklore jingo the warrior empress takenuch her white-haired prime minister holding in his arms her son the infant war god benke the great retainer of yoshitsune yoshitsune himself the marvellous fencer and general kintaro the fat hairy red boy who was born and grew up in the mountains and even in his babyhood fought with bears shokisama the strong man who could conquer oni these are some of the characters to be found on the shelves at the boys feast behind each figure stands a flag with the crest of the hero that it represents and before them are set all manner of weapons in miniature the food offered is mochi wrapped in oak leaves because the oak is among trees what the carp is among fishes the emblem of strength and endurance the flower of this day is the iris or flag because of its sword-shaped leaves hence the name shobu matsuri feast of iris or flag another feast which while not founded for the boys seems to have been adopted by them as a great occasion is what is known as buddha's birthday celebrated on april eighth on this day in every buddhist temple a temporary platform is erected the roof of which is covered with flowers 
upon this platform in a great tub filled with licorice tea is set a small image of the infant buddha hither flock the small boys with bamboo dippers and spend the day ladling up the tea and pouring it over the image and then ladling it out into small bamboo buckets this licorice tea through contact with the image acquires miraculous healing properties and the devout after making offerings of money twisted up in white paper carry away the little buckets the tea is good for the eyes and the throat and if some of it be used in mixing ink and then with the ink thus mixed a charm be written and placed about the house it will keep away all vermin it is not easy to see exactly what the fascination of this feast is to the boys but i am told that many of them like it even better than their own specially appointed day but of all the delights that come into the year there is nothing to compare for joyous excitement with the great matsuri of the parish temple for at least a week beforehand there are enough interesting things going on in every house and shop along the street to keep every small boy in the parish agog from morning till night here are lanterns being made with the mon of the gods on one side and the rising sun of the japanese flag on the other there a dancing platform is being erected and at every stage of its development it is swarming with active youngsters who shin up its poles turn somersaults on the platform and sit in rows on its edge with bare legs swinging high over the heads of the passers-by and when it is done and the drums installed they take turns all day and far into the night in keeping them going then too there are the dashi or floats on one of which each street in the parish spends its money and its ingenuity how the boys haunt the shops in which they are being made how they watch the wondrous changes of paper into flowers and of bamboo and cotton cloth into sea waves or castle walls or monsters of earth or sea or air how they chatter and wriggle and push and squirm for front places when at last the great cars are built up in the open street the marvellous edifices erected upon them and at the top of all the heroic figures of well-known mythological or historical characters rise majestic in flowing robes then when the black bullocks resplendent in collars and halters of red rope are yoked to the triumphal car and the structure moves slowly down the shouting street how the boys crawl into every joint and cranny of the dashi how they hang from every beam how they yell from before and behind in sheer abandon of joy and at last when the procession forms and with fantastically garbed men marching in front and wild-eyed singers yelling just behind them with dancing girls on moving platforms and jugglers and tumblers on the dashi themselves the twenty or more festal cars move with frequent stops down to the temple to escort the sacred symbols on their annual pilgrimage through the parish who so noisy or so ubiquitous as these same bullet-headed blue-gowned boys they bob up at every turn ooze out at every pore of the procession and enjoy as only boys can enjoy the noise and confusion the barbaric splendour the dancing and tumbling the mumming and drumming the excruciating howls of the singers the jingling of the marshal's iron-ringed staves the clapping of the great wooden clappers that time the movement and the stops of the pageant better than all perhaps is the evening when the streets lighted by many lanterns are filled with throngs of holiday-makers now stopping to stare in at some shop where the devout worshipper has established a beautiful shrine has set out mochi and other offerings before some image or has arranged a landscape garden in a box or constructed a matsuri procession just entering the court of a miniature temple now haggling with the ever-present booth-keepers for lanterns or cakes or hairpins to take back to the friends left at home suddenly there is a joyous rhythmic shout of many excited boyish voices there is a gleaming of square red lanterns a whirl and a rush through the crowd 
now is the time to get out of the way for the boys move quickly and are too excited to turn aside for anything on they come at a sharp trot each little round head bound about with a fillet of blue and white toweling each lithe active body more or less covered by a blue and white gown all shouting in unison and bearing on their shoulders a miniature dashi made most often of a sake tub mounted on a frame and decorated with lanterns and white paper they charge through the crowd which makes way quickly at their approach until the pace the weight of their burden and the frantic shouting exhaust their breath then they plunge down a side street rest for a few moments gather themselves together and charge once more into the crowd there must be some pretty tired little boys in the parish when the fun is all over for these performances are kept up far into the night but for absolute and perfect enjoyment there is nothing i have yet seen that seems to me to compare with the enjoyment that a japanese boy gets out of a matsuri it is worth being tired for there is no space in this work for a more detailed picture of life in a japanese home enough has been said in this chapter to show that it is made up of many little things of cares and sorrows and pleasures just as is life in any american home and it is the little things we care about that make the oneness of the family and the nation and the oneness too of humanity if we can only understand one another epilogue my task is ended one half of japan with its virtues and its frailties its privileges and its wrongs has been brought so far as my pen can bring it within the knowledge of the american public if through this work one person setting forth for the land of the rising sun goes better prepared to comprehend the thoughts the needs and the virtues of the noble gentle self-sacrificing women who make up one half the population of the island empire my labor will not have been in vain end of within the home part two end of japanese girls and women by alice m bacon